Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Work From Home Show. I'm Naresh Fitzel with Adam Schrader and we've got, I, we, we've had a lot of special episodes, but I think this is probably one of the most special episodes that given where we are today the friday before a very important election we have a presidential candidate on our show yeah i'm not joking it's it's not trump it's not biden but you have seen his name if you've voted or if you've gotten your your ballot his name is don blankenship he's the presidential nominee for the American Constitution Party, former 2018 nominee for Senate in West Virginia. And how I first heard about him, he was a former chairman and CEO of Massey Energy, which is the sixth largest coal company in the United States, very well-known energy company. So Mr. Don Blankenship, welcome to the Work From Home show. Uh, Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, like I said, it's it's a real treat. So thanks for taking time out of your busy campaign schedule, your press conferences, your media, everything else uh, in giving us the attention. So I want to first start with the American Constitution Party, which is the political party that you are running for. What does the American Constitution Party stand for? And why did you decide to run for this party instead of, say, your typical Republican or other third party? Well, uh, the Constitution Party itself, uh, the name pretty well says what it's mostly about. It's about the Constitution. The party platform is essentially that we should return to the Constitution and the rule of law and that the Constitution is the only platform or the only (coughs) document that... uh, has proven to be successful, and uh, that you know our point is that we've abandoned the Constitution and uh, vested too much power in the federal government, and uh, that as a result we have a country that's on the verge of going bankrupt, that's trying to police the world, and that is having riots all over the country, and that mostly uses its government as a as a drama show on the national networks. So. Uh, that's where the Constitution Party is. We'd like to see the country uh, return to the principles that made it great and uh, get back to uh, being the country that we once were, in our opinion. And as to, as to why I chose that party over the, Const- over the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, I had, for basically a lifetime, been a Republican uh, uh, member and been a large donor. I was the largest donor to the party in the state of West Virginia, had been a big advocate of uh, Republican causes. But basically, the Republicans, as they say, left me instead of me leaving them. And when I ran for the U.S. Senate, uh, they were not helpful. In fact, they uh, came out in opposition to my candidacy and so forth. So I decided I need to look for another party, and uh, when I did look, the Constitution Party uh, stood out as most in line with my views. Why did the Republicans do that? Well, it had to do, if you know about mass energy, you probably are aware of the explosion at the UBB mine in 2010. Uh, You know, I was tried uh, for three felonies in that case and was found not guilty of all of them, but they still sent me to prison for a previously non-existent misdemeanor. And so the Republican Party uh, at least said that they didn't think I could win the general election, but I I think they probably had other beliefs. Uh, you know, they didn't want someone who uh, was purely anti-establishment, uh, had said that I would not vote for Mitch McConnell <clears throat> to continue as Senate Majority Leader, and that uh, we had to get back to the principles of the Constitution and and began to talk again about balanced budgets and stuff like that. 
Yeah, I can imagine that pretty much most of America could say either the Democrat or Republican Party has left them. They all seem to be um, not serving that many people that helpfully. Now, in all honesty, um, probably not breaking any news, your likelihood of winning isn't the greatest this year. But if you were to get in, what are some of the things that the Constitutionalist Party and yourself would want to accomplish in you know the proverbial first hundred days and then moving on down the, the road? I think the first thing I would want is a search and destroy committee on corruption in the government, uh, particularly legalized corruption. Uh, <clears throat> it would be very hard to get done. But uh, things like these Hill committees and uh, Senate leadership funds, they call them and so forth, has basically turned over the uh, election process to the wealthy. And, uh, you know, and the wealthy by that, I mean, on both sides of the aisle. And uh, we need to outlaw Hill committees and we need to, uh, to hold congressional members and other government members to the same laws that the rest of us are obligated to follow. Um, I think we need a total review of the cabinet structure, which cabinet positions we need and which ones we don't need. Do we need some that are uh, not there now and do we need to get rid of some? You know, I think that we need to get rid of the energy department and the uh, education department. Uh, we need to stop policing the world. We do need to control immigration and and uh, attract and invite people to become citizens of the United States that uh, will be coming here to help the country achieve its objectives and we're willing to be part of the melting pot. <clears throat> so there's a lot of things we need to do. Most of what we talk about or they talk about on television are the symptoms of the problems, not the real problems. So we, uh, we need to turn our attention to the symptoms that that caused the election to be uh, something other than fair and honest, and we need to make sure that we clean up the waste and and the uh, and the corruption. Sounds a lot like the the libertarian. I don't want to say libertarian party, but a lot of libertarian concepts, which I identify with. Um, and I'm voting Republican in this election. It's probably no surprise to our listeners. But going back to what Adam said, as a third-party candidate, two kind of quick questions. Number one is, did you guys have some kind of third-party debate where all the third-party candidates were up and um, and kind of showing off these these political parties that don't get much attention? And then my follow-up to that is if um, – like Adam said, he's not breaking news, but uh, the chances of you winning are very, very slim, and I'm sure you, you know that. So what is the idea behind even running? Is it just to promote and spread ideas, bring awareness, or do you actually think that you have a chance at winning? No, I don't think we have any chance of winning. Uh, I think we have a chance of uh, making progress. You know, uh, as they say, the longest journey begins with the first step. There's a I think there is a thirst out there for another party or for a, a different view and for <clears throat> uh, certainly there's a thirst out there for honest government. So uh, I think that this is basically uh, my contribution and the party members contribution to trying to uh, give people hope for the future that we're not always going to be subject to the whims of the two major parties. Uh, I did attend the one third party debate in Denver, uh, I had skipped the one in Cheyenne that they had, uh, I think, last Saturday night. You know, at that debate, uh, it's really frightening. It's almost as frightening to go to the third party debates as it is to watch what goes on on uh, Fox and CNN and the, and the major parties. Um, most of the third party candidates want to do more of what either we have already done, i.e. Green New Deal and so forth and so on or they want to follow the Venezuelan model or some other socially country model. And uh, we should know by now that socialism won't work. Uh, we should have learnt, be able to learn that a Green New Deal in the United States doesn't do anything but take manufacturing and pollution out of the United States and make pollution worse than every other part of the world that we buy the product from. And uh, so it's, uh, it's discouraging that we don't have more candidates out there that are pragmatic, uh, that 
don't want to do the same things that have caused us to be in the position we're in today and that uh, you know simply want to use common sense and honesty to uh, make the country better and make it better for Americans. So coming from a constitutionalist standpoint, what are your thoughts on the promotion of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court? Was Is that someone that you as a party would have um, been happy putting forth? And of course, I didn't know much about her background before the hearings. I watched some of the hearings. I thought she was very impressive. <clears throat> She's very much a at least uh, they say, and what I heard her say on in the Senate hearings, uh, very much in favor of the rule of law as opposed to the rule of the judiciary. And uh, so I liked all that. I thought that Trump and the Senate had every right to do what they did. People uh, get confused by it, but basically, in order to be a Supreme Court justice, you have to be nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And when the Senate is not uh, of the same party in this day and age, it's hard to get confirmed, as uh, was proven, you know, when uh, when the Obama appointed a judge uh, in the last year of the of his presidency. But uh, I think McConnell was wrong not to allow a vote uh, at that time. Uh, but I I don't think there's anything wrong with what Republicans did this time to get uh, Amy Barrett in office or in the, in the, in the court. We have Don Blankenship, former chairman and CEO of Massey Energy Company, one of the largest coal companies in the world, and presidential nominee for the American Constitution Party. I want to shift the talk to the economy and this new work from home. You, as I mentioned, were chairman and CEO of Massey Energy Company. And back when you were working there, I'm not sure if you had a work from home policy or if you allowed employees to work from home from home. But let's first start with tax reform and ideas you have if you were to become president for work from home workers and companies that have been forced to go remote. Well, again, I'm a believer that free enterprise and companies and so forth should, uh, within the confines of the law and the Constitution, do what they think is best for their employees and the relationships between employees and companies is between them. But the government has no significant role in uh, anything that has to do with work at home, work at work, whatever it is that uh, is best for the company. And the mining business, of course, 80, 90 percent of your workers have to be at work because they're mining coal underground, which they can't do from home. So uh, we didn't have a policy about work at home. We had sometimes people would uh, be at home for a few days if they were not feeling well and work at home if they were, you know, had something that they thought was contagious. But uh, uh, it wasn't an issue in the business that I was most involved in. And uh, the government uh can you know get too involved in things like that i think these evolutions of uh, being able to work at home versus being on the job and so forth for more an individual and an individual company uh decision i'm an old school guy so uh you know the work from home thing i just think it'll happen naturally like uh, much other stuff will and that does uh, reduce the energy load. You know, you get to Chicago and places like that, you can't get from home to work anyway, so you might as well stay at home. <laughs> yeah. So if we need an infrastructure package. We need yeah. bullet trains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. So Excellent. easy to do here in Texas. It's yeah. big I mean, underground. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you guys have traveled around the world much, but the problem is that if you travel around the world, and I think that's what got Trump going for a while, is uh, you see how far behind we are. You know, uh, like you said at the end, wow, it's not very optimistic, but it's hard to be optimistic. I used to land in China back in the 80s, and they'd be pouring a, a new runway with wheelbarrows. And now I land there, and they're using, you know, Caterpillar equipment, and their, their airports are better than ours. Their buildings are better than ours. Their billboards are better than ours. They're working on... Uh, being able to charge your electric car as you drive down the road because it'll be uh, scraping uh, some electric current on the highway. Uh, I mean, we're they're developing um, submarines that are faster than ours. They just launched their first aircraft carrier, and and uh, at the same time we're going backwards. So I just hope more of us wake up and realize where we're headed before it's too late. Agreed. So when you're looking at um 
for example, like the tax policy of the country, is it the Constitution Party that kind of believes that the federal government tax wise shouldn't be doing much and we should just leave it for the states to kind of raise the taxes and pay for things or kind of what's the kind of if the I've, obviously I would assume that y'all would be very against the federal government offering incentives to work from home because that would probably be considered a, a big stretch of their powers but kind of what is y'all's take on the the taxes between the federal and the state governments I think that uh, whatever role an individual state has to play in the federal government should be playing determines the their reasonable expenses, and, and then that determines their need for revenue and therefore their need for taxes. I think that uh, the fact that the government can print money and borrow money seemingly endlessly has caused the federal government to be even more wasteful than the state governments, because the state governments at least have some uh, need to be more frugal and more practical. Uh, you know, I I personally think that uh, states like California and New York are extremely wasteful and and uh, they they need to, if you will, uh, suffer their own consequences as governments. You don't want the people to suffer, but at the same token, you can't just keep delving out money and the people in Kansas or Florida or Georgia or anywhere else shouldn't have to subsidize uh, the mistakes or uh, feed the desires and the waste of some of the other states. I don't think that it was intended to be that way, and I don't think it should be that way. As far as environmental policy goes, you worked for a coal company, and I'm sure you have a lot of opinions on the environment. This ties into work from home because when more people are working from home, there's less traffic on the road, less exhaustion. So with more people working from home, and this is a trend that we talk. We started this show because this trend is, is permanent. It's not like two years from now when this virus clears up, everyone's just go back, going to go back to the office. It's, uh, that's just the reality. That's not going to happen. Um, how do you think this work from home trend is going to change the environment and environmental policy moving forward, regardless of who's in the White House? Again, I think work from home is a, a marketplace issue that will be determined by the market. I mean, if somebody can stay at home, uh, the company may, if they need to, they may ask that they work for less since they don't spend money traveling back and forth. Or on the other hand, they don't have to provide office space or uh, material or whatever. Perhaps they uh, pay them more. But I see that as a company and a, an employee uh, relationship, not as a government issue. What would be the future of alternative greener energies? And we keep hearing about these expensive plans. Uh, is there a future for those or no? Yeah, I think there's a future, but I think that sometimes we get the future in front of the present. Uh, you know, it's it's fine for the government and or universities and others to develop uh, alternative energies and, you know, and uh, in a lab or in a, a prototype. The facility make them, but these large subsidies for uh, alternative energy that the utility payer has to pay, and then you have to give the utility payer money because they can't afford the bill and so forth, serves no purpose. But the biggest problem I have with uh, the environmental movement, if you want to call that, or the green movement or the new green deal, is it's in the United States at least, it's mostly a, a big business that people make a lot of money off of. and it's not a big cause. It's uh, anything that you go out to do uh, has a cost and a benefit. And if you actually believe that worldwide pollution of, say, carbon emissions is a major problem, and you are, uh, uh, com you know, if you have common sense, if you're a manager, if you truly believe that the world's going to overheat, you wouldn't be doing anything in the United States to uh, to lower carbon emissions because. You can lower carbon emissions in other parts of the world for 10 cents on the dollar compared to what you can here. And if carbon emissions is a worldwide pollutant, then you get more benefit from the same amount of dollars. Uh, what we did in this country starting in 1990 under the Clean Air Act, we cleaned up uh, our utilities, whether they were burning coal or whether they were some other type of utility. We made them very environmental friendly. 
except for carbon emissions. We took out mercury, we took out NOx and SOx and arsenic and all kinds of pollutants that were supposedly causing uh, acid rain and deformed babies and so forth and so on. And then once the public had paid billions of dollars in taxes and their rates, utility rates, uh, we shut those plants down under the name of carbon uh, emissions or global, you know, climate change or global warming, transferred those energy needs by transferring the manufacturing to Asia. And then all those products that we bought at Walmart, Target and Lowe's were bought uh, from those countries wherein they had put up more arsenic, more mercury, more sulfur, you know, more acid rain, if you will, more deformed babies and, and declared victory. But so long as the four to five percent of the world population that's in the United States or the small amount of population that's in Western Europe is uh, taking away the quality of life of its citizens in order to transfer pollution to other countries, I will know that it's not a serious uh, effort to actually reduce worldwide pollutants. So one of the things that surprised me in the final presidential debate was when Trump came out and called Biden out and said, you know, that the future of oil drilling and it seems to me that the big oil and the big energy companies have been shifting away from oil and into alternative energy so where what do you think we'll be seeing in that we're using for energy say 50 years from now kind of what are your thoughts on what will our society be using um, energy wise then well i think that uh, the electric car is going to be the uh, biggest single change that we're going to see in the energy picture even bigger than the environmental what i call in environmental extremism uh, that we've experienced again in the developed countries that the electric car is going to decrease the demand for oil so greatly that uh, it could even lead to world war in a sense that countries in the middle east that have lived off of uh, high-priced oil or some in South America and other places are going to find it very difficult uh, as, the, as the world moves to the electric car. And that'll be the <clears throat> single biggest change in the, uh, will come in the transportation energy. I don't know, uh, you know, I've tried to figure out from what's available to me exactly what that means in terms of how much, uh, how many kilowatt hours we'd have to produce to replace X percent of the oil and gasoline use. But uh, it's obviously going to be a huge change. Uh, that, that transition is going to be difficult. The oil companies are going to have a tremendous struggle. And, uh, you know, people who have lived as long as I have, you know, grew up in the 1950s uh, and remember when uh, cars were a, were a luxury item, uh, know that even then gas stations could be far apart and so forth. So I can envision that there will be electric recharging stations all over the United States and the country will look totally different. So uh, that's where we're headed on the, on that end. I assume that on the, on the, uh, you know, electricity at home side that uh, solar will do quite well. But what we've done so far is we spent a lot of money and not had as much benefit as the market will give us. The market will fix it uh, much more efficiently and much better than the government will. Don, you brought up that you attended a third party debate. Was that televised on a major network? No, I think they refused to televise it. Uh, you had uh, what, Howie Hawkins and uh, uh, is it Brock? I forget his oh, last name. Brock, uh, yeah, we tried getting him on our show. Brock Pierce, the bit cryptocurrency Hollywood yeah. actor. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you had some named Gloria that's a uh, acknowledged socialist that thinks we should follow the Venezuelan Chavez I saw, thing. I saw that because, the, yeah, a woman for the socialist party because her VP is an Indian man and I'm an Indian man. So I, was, I saw the ballot and I was like, who is this person? And I, I, I heard that they're in the same book club. That's how they, that's how he became the VP nominee there. They were in the same book club. Yeah, people don't do their research. You know, Venezuela's got 600% inflation. They've got national medical coverage. But in some cases, you have to take your own instruments to the hospital when you're going to have surgery. And they, uh, you know, they, they're basically got people that are on the verge of, of starving. So it's a, 
And what happened was when Chavez was in office, they had, you know, 80 and hundred dollar oil. And uh, as a major oil producer, they, uh, they had nothing income that they could be socialist. But if you don't have something like that, uh, it's very hard to be a socialist country because human beings just don't work as hard for their neighbor as they do for themselves. So what's the path forward for your party? Is it obviously starting at the presidential level is a very difficult place to start. So where, how, what's the path forward for the Constitution Party that you envision happening? Does it have to start at like city council and moving up that way or kind of where, what's the path? Well, I have some experience of that. You know, I converted West Virginia from Democrat to Republican, or at least the Democrats give me credit for doing that. Uh, <clears throat> we did it uh, with one big election, which was for a West Virginia Supreme Court seat. Uh, West Virginia hadn't elected a Republican to the West Virginia Supreme Court in 80 some years. And uh, they had one that was said by Brit Hume and the national media to be unbeatable. But uh, I decided to try to beat him, and we basically beat him because we discovered that he had made a court decision to release a pedophile early and stuff like that. And we were able to find that one-off situation where we could beat a guy with, uh, you know, U.S.-wide uh, notoriety. And then that set up the momentum, and we used that momentum in the House of Delegate races, which were very local and uh, small, and therefore you could win door-to-door -door campaigning as opposed to running television ads at a huge cost. So we uh, we eventually won control of the House of Delegates and the West Virginia Senate. I think looking at that and trying to learn from that, the Constitution Party needs to pick a couple of states where they're uh, uh, strong. Uh, and, you know, the Constitution Party, you may or may not know, has different names in different states. Sometimes it's the U.S. taxpayers' policy. The, uh, party and sometimes just a independent American party, but pick a state where you've got a pretty good foundation, find some real good candidates for, you know, House of Delegate or State Senate, maybe a few other things and, uh, and fund that and, and get some notoriety. And the other way to get notoriety is in the swing states. Uh, we didn't do very well this time uh, getting prepared because of COVID-19 is hard to get petition signatures to get on the ballot when you can't get within six foot of the signer. But uh, in the future, I think they can pick and choose states and become a factor in the election and get earned media time, which is what needs to be done if the party is to become prominent in the near term. Don Blankenship, presidential nominee for the American Constitution Party. Um, it's, I just find it fascinating, this whole third party thing and your name's on the ballot. I mean, you're on the same line as President Trump and Vice President Biden. How did you, what did you have to do? What hurdles did you have to overcome to get your name on the ballot? Because someone who has the brand name and the money like Kanye West, he was not in your uh, third party debate, but he struggled to get on many, really most states ballots. How difficult is it? How much money do you need? Do you have to do a lot of fundraising? Do you need to get a lot of signatures? Walk us through that process. Well, to get on every ballot in the U.S., I would say it would cost you a couple million dollars. So I don't know uh, <clears throat> Mr. West's uh, strategy or how he went about it. It looked like he got off to a late start. And that probably yeah, it was late. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, it, it's not difficult except except that it takes a lot of money. I mean, in California, you got to get 200,000 signatures and you're probably going to pay $3 per signature. So you're going <clears> to <throat> spend 600,000 just in California. The Constitution Party is on 20 some states uh, pretty well. Uh, so they don't have to get on all of them with petitions. And every state has a different law. So uh, it's not easy to get on all of them, but uh, it can be done. And uh, it's just a matter of uh, having the money and uh, having a plan and knowing what the law is in each state. Excellent, Don Blankenship. All the best on the upcoming election and in all your future endeavors. Former 2018 nominee for Senate in West Virginia, former chairman and CEO of the Massey Energy Company, the sixth largest coal company in the United States. For those who want more information, on Mr. Blankenship, visit donblankenship.com, B-L-A-N-K-E-N-S-H-I-P, 
donblankenship.com. Mr. Blankenship, any final thoughts you want to share with our listeners or anything else you want to promote? I think the biggest thing I would say to the listeners is that, you know, you can't just go on what your daily life is like because there's clouds on the horizon and uh, the national media is very much in lockstep with the two major parties. You can't believe what you see on there and uh, you need to educate yourself because the country can't continue to spend trillions of dollars more than it takes in and, uh, and again, police the world and, and survive with this corruption. From those of us that think this is going to go on forever are going to be sadly disappointed because it's not going to go on forever. We, uh, we are not the country we once were, and we're still headed in the wrong direction. Wow. Well, thanks for those optimistic thoughts, Don Blankenship. To all our listeners, again, donblankenship.com. Our website is workfromhomeshow.com, www.workfromhomeshow.com. If you have any questions for us or want us to relay something to Mr. Blankenship or his campaign, email us, hello at workfromhomeshow.com. That's hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Leave us a review on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever podcasting platform you use. And until next time, keep on working from home.